So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Daniel Friedman. I'm a second year PhD student here in the Fossey department. I'm also along with Rupert Sparling, a co-president of our Graduate Student Society, the Hume Society. And it's in that capacity that I have the honor and the privilege of welcoming Professor Robert Brandom today to join us as our 2021 Hume Society speaker. Professor Brandom is joining us from the University of Pittsburgh where he is distinguished professor of philosophy. His influential work spans a number of philosophical areas. He's made significant contributions to debates in the philosophy of language, philosophy of mind and logic, as well as in German idealism and neo-pragmatism. His influential contributions across wide ranging philosophical terrain are captured in a number of seminal works, including Making It Explicit, Reasoning, Representing and Discursive Commitment, Tales of the Mighty Dead, Historical Essays in the Metaphysics of Intentionality, Between Saying and Doing, Towards an Analytic Pragmatism, as well as Professor Brandom's most recent work, A Spirit of Trust, A Reading of Hegel's Phenomenology. Professor Brandom has given a number of prestigious lectures as well, including the House and Townsend Lectures at Cal in 1997, the John Locke Lectures at Oxford in 2006, the Woodbridge Lectures at Columbia in 2007, and the Brentano Lectures at the University of Vienna in 2019, among many others. These notable contributions to vast and varied philosophical debates are among the many reasons that grad students were so excited to invite Professor Brandom to join us today. And I think I speak for everyone when I say it's truly a pleasure to have you here with us. Professor Brandom will be talking today about representation, expression, and recollection, semantic dimensions of Hegel's phenomenology. Please join me in welcoming him. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, my talk is gonna be in three parts. And first I wanna talk about Hegel's idealism. On the ground floor of his intellectual edifice stands his non-psychological conception of the conceptual. This is the idea that to be conceptually contentful is to stand in relations of material incompatibility and consequence his determinate negation and mediation, to stand in those relations to other such contentful items. The relations of incompatibility and consequence are denominated material to indicate that they articulate contents rather than the form of what stands in those relations. This is his first and most basic semantic idea, an understanding of conceptual content in terms of modally robust relations of exclusion and inclusion. The next move is to think of the relation between conceptual content, so understood, and the forms that such contents can take. The result is a hylomorphic conception of the conceptual. Conceptual contents understood as roles with respect to relations of material incompatibility and consequence are amphibious. They show up in two different forms. They have a subjective form and an objective form. The subjective form articulates what things are or can be for consciousness, as he says. And the objective form articulates what things are or can be in themselves. The second is the form of empirical reality. The first is the form in which that empirical reality appears to knowing subjects. They're related as two poles of the intentional nexus what can be known and the attempted knowing of it, noumena and phenomena. The possibility of genuine knowledge requires that one and the same content can show up in both forms, the subjective form of thought and the objective form of fact. Conceptual contents of the two forms stand in a broadly representational relation to one another as subjective representings of reality and the objective realities represented. Hegel's second semantic idea is this consequence of the hylomorphic development of the first, the idea that the two forms of conceptual content stand to one another in representational relations. The two dimensions of semantic contentfulness, the intelligible and the representational, can be thought of as Hegelian versions of the Frigian metaconcepts of sense and reference, Zinn and Bedeutung, thoughts and what thoughts are about, what can be expressed and what can be represented. And that's a thought I'll return to after a while. Hegel's semantic explanatory strategy is to explain the representational dimension of conceptual contentfulness in terms of the more basic sense of conceptual contentfulness as articulated by relations of material incompatibility and consequence. What it is to represent something is to be understood in terms of relations 
among conceptual contents. The idea of a noumenal reality is to be explained in terms of how phenomenal appearances point beyond themselves in virtue of their relations to one another. This is one sense in which his book counts as a phenomenology. The account is essentially expressivist and historical, and its key concept is recollection. Another idea that's of the first importance for this enterprise is that conceptual content in the most basic sense is an essentially modal notion. The relations that in the first instance articulate conceptual contents of either form are modal relations. Incompatibility relations codify conjunctions in a broad sense that do not merely happen to hold, but that are forbidden or ruled out. Consequential relations codify conjunctions that do not just happen to hold, but they're obligatory or must hold. The relations of incompatibility and consequence that Hegel understands as articulating conceptual contents are related to one another as the two paired modalities of necessity and possibility, where obligation and prohibition are related to one another. That's one of the ways that negation is built so deeply into his system. Of course, it matters a lot for such a view how the modal force in question is understood. Here, Hegel's further revolutionary idea is that the two forms conceptual contents can show up in correspond to two different kinds of modality. Modal relations of incompatibility and consequence have both alethic and deontic forms. They can be given both nomological and normative readings. These are the modalities that articulate the objective realm of being, reality, how things are in themselves, and the subjective realm of thought, appearance, how things are for consciousness, how they're taken to be, respectively. On the objective side of reality, the properties of being a mammal and being a reptile are incompatible in the sense that it's impossible for them to be conjoined in one object at the same time. The property of being a mammal has being a vertebrate as a consequence in the sense that it's necessary that any creature that's a mammal is a vertebrate. On the subjective side of thought, it's not impossible to take one and the same creature to be both a mammal and a reptile. Those thoughts are incompatible rather in the sense that one ought not to conjoin them. If one takes a creature to be a mammal, it's possible that one does not also take it to be a vertebrate, but one ought to do so one is committed or obliged to do so. The relations of incompatibility and consequence that articulate the conceptual contents of objective properties and states of affairs are alethic modal relations of non-compossibility and necessity, paradigmatically codified in laws of nature. The relations of incompatibility and consequence that articulate the conceptual contents of subjective thoughts are deontic normative relations. Two thought contents are incompatible when, cannot, when one cannot be entitled to commitments to both, though one might go ahead and do so anyway. One thought consequence is a consequence of another when commitment to one entails commitment to the other, though the actual attitudes of individual thinking subjects might not always actually include acknowledging that normative status. The resulting view is a kind of conceptual realism for it takes the reality thought about, no less than thoughts about it, always already to be in conceptual shape. And it does that by starting with a conception of the conceptual that's not restricted to thoughts as thinkings, as psychological events or processes. It ties the conceptual to thought only in the Frigian sense of thinkables. This is the sense in which Frege himself says, a fact is a thought that is true. On this conception, to be conceptually contentful is to stand in relations of incompatibility and consequence, to exclude and include other conceptually contentful items. The relations of incompatibility and consequence that articulate conceptual contents, and so count as material relations, are modally robust ones. So Hegel's is a modal conceptual realism, and his particular version is hylomorphic. Conceptual contents can take two forms, subjective and objective. And those two forms correspond to two different kinds of modality, alethic and deontic, or nomological and normative. 
what accordingly becomes visible as bimodal hylomorphic conceptual realism makes intelligible the possibility of genuine knowledge by understanding conceptual content as actualizable in two forms, an objective form articulated by alethic nomological relations of necessary consequence and non-compossibility, and a subjective form articulated by deontic normative relations of obligatory consequence and prohibited conjunction. On an account of this shape, the subjective and objective poles of the intentional nexus, representings in thought, and what in reality is represented thereby, correspond to the two modal forms that conceptual contents can take. So implementing the semantic explanatory strategy of showing how to understand the representational dimension of conceptual contentfulness, what we might call of intentionality, in terms of the expressive dimension, what we might call that intentionality, requires explaining the relations between nomological and normative preclusion and inclusion between alethic and deontic incompatibility and consequence. For it's those notions of incompatibility and consequence that articulate the two forms, objective and subjective, of conceptual contents. At the grossest level of structure, the objective realm of being is articulated by nomological relations. And the subjective realm of thought is articulated by norm-governed processes, activities, or practices. And it can be asked then how things stand with the intentional nexus between these realms. Should it be construed in relational or practical processual terms? If those aren't mutually exclusive, and that's how Hegel in fact understand things, so that both semantic relations and pragmatic discursive activities of knowing and acting are essential, does one have conceptual, that is explanatory priority over the other? What I call objective idealism asserts that the nomological and normative aspects of those relations and practices, what's expressed by alethic and deontic modal vocabulary respectively, respectively, are reciprocally sense dependent. Understanding these two aspects of the two realms is symmetric. Each can be understood only as part of a whole that contains the other as well. For the norms articulate what one must do in order to count thereby as claiming that the nomological relations hold. But what about the activities and relations themselves? Hegel takes there to be an explanatory asymmetry in that the semantic relations between those discursive practices and the objective relations they know about and exploit practically are instituted by the discursive practices that both articulate the subjective realm of thought and establish its relations to the objective realm of being. This asymmetry claim, privileging specifically recollective discursive practices over semantic relations in understanding the intentional nexus between subjectivity and objectivity is the thesis I call conceptual idea. So the view that Hegel develops in the phenomenology, I'm expressing here by means of two radical, distinctively Hegelian theses, bimodal hylomorphic conceptual realism and recollective conceptual idealism. Because cognitively, the objective world is both the cause of sense and the goal of intellect, the first a nomological matter and the second a normative one, Cognition involves both alethic modal and deontic normative relations between the objective realm of being, whose structure is articulated by alethic modal relations, and the subjective realm of thought, whose structure is articulated by deontic normative relations. The first are relations of epistemic tracking. They support subjunctively robust conditionals of the form, if the objective facts were different or were to change in such and such ways, the commitments endorsed in thought would be different in these and those ways. These conditionals articulate a dimension of authority, what Hegel calls independence, of the objective world over subjective thoughts, a dimension of responsibility, what he calls dependence, of thought on fact. This is the subjective sensitivity of thoughts to things. <clears throat> 
The second sort of relations are relations of normative responsibility of thought to fact. What things are for consciousness ought to conform to what things are in themselves. And those normative relations too express the authority of the objective over the subjective. Because practically the objective world is both the arena of action and the target of intention, intentional agency also involves both a lethic modal and deontic normative relations between the subjective and objective realms. Agency is efficacious insofar as subjunctively robust conditionals of the form, if the agent's practical commitments had been different, the events in the objective world would have been different. These articulate a dimension of authority of the subjective over the objective, a dimension of dependence of the objective world on subjective practical commitments. The normative standard of success of intentional agency is set by intentions in relation to how things objectively are after an action. The idea of action includes a background structural commitment to the effect that things ought to be as they're intended to be. Conceptual idealism focuses on the fact that all these cognitive and practical, alethic and normative modal relations are instituted or established by the ultimately recollective activity that is the final phase of the cycle of cognition and action. Conceptual realism asserts the identity of conceptual content between facts and thoughts of those facts, at least when all goes well. Here we can think of Wittgenstein saying, when we say and mean that such and such is the case, we and our meaning do not stop anywhere short of the fact, but we mean this is so. That's from section 95 of the investigation. Conceptual idealism offers a pragmatic account of the practical process by which that semantic intentional relation between what things are for consciousness and what things are in themselves is established. Pragmatics, as I'm using the term, is the study of the use of concepts by subjects engaging in discursive practices. Conceptual idealism asserts a distinctive kind of explanatory priority, a kind of authority of pragmatics over semantics. For this reason, Hegel's is a pragmatist semantic explanatory strategy, and its idealism is a pragmatist idealism. The sui generis rational practical activity, given pride of explanatory place by this sort of pragmatism, Hegel calls recollection. That's the topic of the second part of my talk to which I now turn. The beating heart of the phenomenology is the concept of experience, or foul. It's of the essence of the reading I'm presenting that the notion of experience functions at two level, levels corresponding to two fundamental kinds of concepts that Hegel distinguishes. These are logical, speculative, or philosophical concepts, he calls it begrifflich or begreifend, on the one hand, and ordinary empirical and practical concepts, what he calls determinate concepts, on the other. The origin of the distinction lies in Kant's revolutionary idea that besides the concepts that we deploy to describe and explain empirical goings on, there are concepts whose distinctive expressive role it is to make explicit crucial structural features of the framework that makes description and explanation possible. Among them, for Kant, are alethic modal and deontic normative concepts. Kant thought there was a single set of such categories, pure concepts of the understanding, that could express the structure of discursive activity überhaupt. The recollective story Hegel tells in the phenomenology is a rationally reconstructed history of the expressively progressive development of what he calls shapes of self-consciousness, which are articulated by different, more or less adequate categorical meta-concepts. It culminates, he thinks, in a single set of expressively adequate philosophical meta-concepts. The master strategy that animates my reading of Hegel, and as far as that goes, of Kant, is what I call semantic descent, 
the idea that the ultimate point of studying these categorical meta concepts is what their use can teach us about the semantic contentfulness of ground level concepts. So the best way to understand the categorical meta concepts is to use them to talk about the use and content of ordinary concepts. It's because it's aimed at extracting such lessons that what I offer is a semantic reading of the phenomenology. And it counts as a, pragmatic, as a pragmatist semantic reading because the key to understanding the conceptual contentfulness common to the objective empirical world of lawfully related facts about objects and their properties and the normative subjective activity of thinking undertaking commitments by inferring and claiming, referring and classifying, is found to lie in the discursive practice and process of experience. And the lead role in Hegel's account of experience as instituting semantic relations is played by recollection, his notion of erinnerung. The pragmatic meta-concept of the process of experience is first put in play in the introduction of the phenomenology at the very beginning of the book in the form of the experience of error. It's invoked to explain how the consciousness constitutive distinction and relation between what things are for consciousness and what they are in themselves shows up as he says carefully to consciousness itself. Hegel's terminology of what things are explicitly for consciousness and what things are in themselves implicitly, an sich, is his preferred way of talking about the intentional nexus that relates the subjective realm of thought, the way things appear to subjects, with the objective realm of being, the way things really are. It is, as emerges already in the introduction, the phenomenon addressed by the distinction between subjective representings and objective represented, baked into early modern philosophical thought about mind and knowledge by Descartes. I suggest that we can think about it as the fundamental semantic relation between what Frege calls sense and referent. The question is how this crucial distinction already shows up practically for even the most meta-theoretically naive knowing subject. How are we to understand the basic fact that as Hegel says, quote, the difference between the in itself and the for itself is already present in the very fact that consciousness knows an object at all. Something is to it, the in itself, but the knowledge or the being of the object for consciousness is to it still another moment, end of the quote. This is the most primitive practical form of self-consciousness, awareness of what consciousness is. And he thinks it's available even to conceptually untutored what he calls natural consciousness. Hegel traces its origin to the experience of error, to what happens when a subject inevitably, eventually discovers that it is in some instance wrong, that things are not in fact as they seemed. It's in having to give up a view that becomes untenable, that it becomes visible as a view, a representing, normatively answerable for its correctness to how things actually are to what is represented. When an error is practically acknowledged, what was to the subject a reality is unmasked and revealed as merely a guise, an appearance, a way things were only for the subject. One took the partially immersed stick to be bent. On pulling it all the way out of the water, one sees that it was really straight all along. One's prior view shows up as just a view, a way it looked, an appearance. That change of view involves distinguishing how things merely look from how they really are. Hegel finds the roots of this experience in our biological nature as desiring beings. Now, I wanna talk about this triadic or rectic uh, theory of basic consciousness. Uh, I devote an entire chapter in the book to it. Here, we're gonna get a paragraph and a half, but uh, I just wanna register it. For a kind of desire, such as hunger, comes with a characteristic associated sort of practical activity, eating. There's the desire and the activity it motivates. And responding to something in the environment by engaging in that activity, eating it, 
is according it a distinctive sort of practical significance, food. This triadic nature I want to talk about is the relation between hunger and eating and food. The very same desire that motivates the associated activity and defines that practical significance then serves as a proto-normative standard of correctness. What a creature practically takes or treats as food by eating it can turn out not really to be food if eating it does not satisfy the hunger that motivated it. Eating something that turns out to be disgusting or just unsatisfying is the most primitive form of the experience of error. In it, one learns that what one took to be food, what practically appeared to one as food, what one erectically represented as food, was not in fact food. When a creature goes through, goes through that process of error and discovery, the distinction between what things are for it, the practical significance it practically assigned to them, and what things are in themselves, the practical significance they actually have as assessed by the satisfaction of its own desire, becomes something to that creature. It's how a distinction between appearance and reality shows up practically already for preconceptual, merely desiring organisms. This sort of experience is the basis and practical form of learning. It's because it is also for Hegel, the practical basis of the semantic distinction between representings and representeds, sense and reference, that his deserves to be called a pragmatist semantics. We saw that the most basic concept in the purely semantic strand of Hegel's thought is his understanding of the conceptual in the sense of the graspable, what thoughts have in common with facts, his understanding of that in terms of relations of incompatibility and consequence. This is the semantic basis from which the expressive recollective account of the representational dimension of conceptual content is elaborated. It too is explained in terms of the experience of error. For an essential part of the acknowledgement of error is practically or taking is practically taking or treating two commitments as incompatible. Such genuinely conceptual activity goes beyond what merely desiring beings engage in. The origins of Hegel's idea here lie in Kant's earlier broadly pragmatist account already of what knowing subjects must do in order to count as apperceiving. Apperception is sapient awareness as opposed to the merely sentient awareness exhibited by desiring animals. For Kant, to be aware in the narrower apperceptive sense is to synthesize a constellation of commitments that exhibits a distinctive kind of unity, apperceptive unity. This is a rational unity, and hence he thinks a discursive unity in the sense of one that is conceptually articulated. And it's a rational unity because of the distinctive kind of norms that govern its synthesis. Synthesizing a constellation of commitments, both doxastic and practical, exhibiting the rational unity distinctive of apperception is practically acknowledging a variety of task responsibilities. The one that matters most for Hegel's later construal of the experience of error is the critical task responsibility to extrude incompatible commitments. When one finds oneself with commitments that are incompatible by one's own lights, that is according to the contents one thereby counts as attributing to them, one must practically acknowledge the responsibility to do something, to change or relinquish at least one of those commitments. There's also, in Kant, a rational ampliative task responsibility to acknowledge commitment to the consequences of one's commitments, to draw conclusions that rationally follow from them. And further, there's a justificatory responsibility to be able to give reasons justifying the commitments one incorporates in that evolving constellation. Being apperceptively aware or conscious of something is discursive awareness of it, bringing it under a concept. The concept is for Kant accordingly a rule that determines what is incompatible with what, giving specific content to one's critical rational task responsibility. And what's a consequence of what? Giving specific content to one's ampliative and justificatory task responsibilities. Conceptual contentfulness is suitability to play a functional role 
in the process of synthesizing a constellation of commitments that exhibits the rational unity characteristic of apperception. So conceptual content is a matter of standing in relations of material incompatibility and consequence to other such conceptually contentful items. Kant's is accordingly a broadly pragmatist account because the notion of conceptual content, which is the subject of semantics, is understood functionally in terms of the norm governed practical synthetic activity by which one's commitments evolve and develop, which is the subject of pragmatics. Hegel builds on Kant's model and develops it in his account of the experience of error. And in doing so, he naturalizes Kant's account in a broad sense, bringing it down to earth by grounding it in the preconceptual experience of desiring animals. But he also radicalizes and generalizes both the methodological pragmatism that consists in reading off an account of conceptual contentfulness from an account of rational activity and the specific focus on incompatibility and consequence as the relations that articulate conceptual content. He further substantially adds to the picture of the experiential process that shapes the development of the constellation of commitments that what Hegel calls the concept comprises. As Kant would, Hegel sees a single episode of experiencing error as beginning with the registration of an anomaly, the acknowledgement that one finds oneself with commitments that are incompatible in the sense that one cannot become entitled to them both or to all of them. They preclude jointly fulfilling one's justificatory responsibility. Practically acknowledging that incompatibility is taking oneself to be obliged to do something, to change something. This is the obligation to engage in a process of repair of the anomaly, to replace rational discords with rational harmony by altering or giving up some of the offending commitments. So the first stage is registration of an anomaly. The second is a process of repair. At this point, Hegel breaks from the Kantian picture by adding a crucial constraint on what count as successful repairs. Not just any rejiggering that removes the incompatibility suffices. Successful repairs for Hegel must explain and justify the changes made in a special way by taking a distinctive form. The addition of this requirement, the characterization of this constraint is one of Hegel's big ideas and stands at the center of the conceptual idealism and so the pragmatist semantics of the phenomenology. Hegel's idea is that the vindication of a proposed reparative strategy in response to acknowledgement of incompatible commitments must take the form of a special kind of historical narrative, a recollection. One must tell a retrospective story that rationally reconstructs an ideally expressively progressive trajectory through previous changes of view that culminates in the view being endorsed after the repair of the most recently disco discovered anomaly. In the first stage of the experience of error, the previous conception of how things are, what played the role to consciousness of what things are in themselves has been unmasked as appearance and has accordingly shifted status. It now plays the role to consciousness of being only what things were for consciousness, an erroneous view of how things really are. To justify endorsing a new view as veridically representing how things really are in themselves, one must show how, assuming that things are that way, one did, or at least could have, come to know that things are that way. Doxastic commitments, judgments, or beliefs are for Hegel implicitly knowledge claims. He has characteristic versions of all three of the dimensions of classical conceptions of knowledge as justified true belief. What I've been calling commitments, a kind of normative status, are the analogs of thoughts or belief, beliefs, putative knowings. In his deontically inflected conception of the geistic realm of thought, Conceptual realism teaches that the truth dimension of such claims to knowledge is a matter of thought and fact being different forms that share a common conceptual content. The demand for recollective vindication of one's commitments 
codifies Hegel's version of the justification dimension of claims to knowledge. This distinctive recollective form of justification requires showing how the previous views one held in the process leading up to the current candidate can properly be understood as views, appearances, or representings of what one now endorses as the reality one claims was all along being viewed, appearing, or being represented. They were unmasked as mere appearances, but they are appearances of what was really there, representings of it. To be entitled to the claim that things are as one now takes them to be, one must show how one found out that they are so. And doing that involves explaining what one's earlier views got right, what they got wrong, and why. Doing that involves explaining what one's, sorry, it involves rationally reconstructing the sequence of one's previous views of what one now takes to be the same topic, so as to exhibit it as a process of learning, of gradual discovery of how things actually are. This is the progressive emergence into explicitness, the ever more adequate expression of what is retrospectively discerned as having been all along implicit as the norm governing and guiding the process by which its appearances arise and pass away. Offering such a retrospective historical rational reconstruction of the process leading up to the constellation of commitments whose endorsement is being vindicated as the lesson properly to be learned from the earlier registration and reparative phases is the third and final recollective phase of an episode of the experience of error. Recollection, Hegel's Erinnerung, turns a past into a history. It transforms a mere description of past commitments into a progressive narrative of a sequence of lessons whereby how things really are in themselves, according to one's current commitments, gradually came to be revealed through that progressive sequence of ever more adequate appearances, culminating in one's happy state of, as one takes it to be, knowledge of how things really are. A recollecting narrative is a rehearsal of expressive progress. It's a story about how what is now revealed to have been all along implicit in prior commitments as the reality they were appearances of, the noumena behind the phenomena, gradually emerged to become fully explicit, showing up as what it really is in the, in the view currently endorsed in which that process culminated. It's a story of how what things are in themselves, an sich, implicitly, becomes what they are for consciousness. A recollection accordingly exhibits past commitments that have been discarded because of their incompatibil incompatibility with others as genuine, if only partially correct, appearances of reality as it's now known to be, and in that sense is not merely illusory. This recollective phase of the experience of error is meant to explain of intentionality in terms of that intentionality, the representational dimension of thought in terms of its conceptual contentfulness. Conceptual contentfulness in Hegel's sense, recall, is what thoughts and facts, phenomena and noumena can share, being articulated by relations of material incompatibility and consequence to other similarly contentful items. What practically distinguishes what's taken or treated by a conscious subject as noumenal, as how things really are in themselves, from what it takes or treats as phenomenal, as presenting an appearance of things, is just the subject's commitment to or endorsement of the content. This is adopting an attitude, acknowledging or undertaking a normative status. Doxastically endorsing a conceptual content is taking it to be a fact. That what one takes to be facts, which contents exactly one endorses, changes, is just a change in the status of the contents involved during the registration and repair stages of the experience of error. The old content changes status from being endorsed to not being endorsed, and its replacement changes status from not being endorsed to being endorsed. What was to consciousness noumenal reality is unmasked as phenomenal appearance and replaced by a different content, newly endorsed as objectively factual. 
the recollective stage of an experience of error justifies this change of status by forging a distinctive kind of link between the content newly endorsed as noumenal and all the previously endorsed contents that are now taken to be phenomena. It's a representational link in virtue of which they show up to the conscious subject as phenomenal appearances of that noumenal reality. That representational link is forged by offering a retrospective, recollective, rational reconstruction of a sequence of phenomena culminating in the facts as one currently takes them to be. That rational reconstruction exhibits them as all along implicitly governed by their link to that noumenal reality in the sense that it serves as the normative standard by which their adequacy as phenomenal appearances of it is to be assessed. This recollective story about the representational of conceptual content is crucially an expressive account of it. It explains how what was, according to each recollection, always implicit, ansich, what things are in themselves, how that becomes ever more explicit for consciousness. The recollective story is an expressively progressive one. The representational relation between senses and reference is established by displaying a sequence of appearances that are ever more adequate expressions of an underlying reality. In general, Hegel thinks we can only understand what's implicit in terms of the expressive process by which it's made explicit. That is for him always a retrospective recollective process. The underlying reality is construed as implicit in the sense of being a norm that all along governed the process of its gradual emergence into explicitness. Without at any earlier point being fully explicit to the consciousness undergoing the experience, according to the recollection that unveils it as what the appearances were appearances of, it nonetheless practically, hence implicitly, governed the process. According to the retrospective rational reconstruction that is the recollection, it served as a normative standard for better and worse appearances, accordingly as they revealed, expressed that reality more adequately. And, accordingly to, and according to the recollection, those assessments were efficacious. The meta-norm that governs recollection, determining better and worse recollections, demands expressive progress, progress in making explicit what shows up as having been all along implicit. This recollective notion of expression is accordingly more fundamental than the notion of representation that it's called on to explain. A recollective reconstruction does that by exhibiting the various erroneous beliefs that things are thus and so, phenomena, as appearances of the facts as they really are, noumena. A recollection performs a great reversal. What eventuates from a process of repeated experiences of error as its final, well, so far, end or result, is placed, as it were, also at the beginning of the sequence. As Eliot says, we shall not cease from exploration, and at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Hegel often uses circular imagery in this connection. For the fact is seen as what drives its progressive revelation. How things actually are is recollectively revealed as normatively governing the process, both deontically as a standard of assessment of expressive success and alethically as that to which the episodes that count as expressively progressive turn out to have been subjunctively sensitive. It is at once the cause of a course of experience and its goal. Stories of this recollective vindicating sort are familiar from various institutional practices. Old fashioned histories of science typically took the form of pointing to some feature of current scientific theories, say that genes are encoded by sequences of DNA bear pay, base pairs, or the division between subatomic particles described by Fermi Dirac statistics and those described by Bose Einstein statistics as exclusive and exhaustive, and so on and then offering a canned Whiggish account of the process by which this truth was gradually discovered. One feature emerging from this experiment or conceptual breakthrough, another from that one. False starts, wrong turns and dead ends 
are ignored by this kind of history of science, except insofar as some bit of truth is taken to have been revealed thereby. For another example, the final results of complex medical diagnoses are explained by telling stories of this sort. Even though the patient did have an infection, the absence of cytokines in the blood showed that contrary to what we had thought, the fever must be exogenous, and so on. And recollective vindications also play an absolutely essential role in jurisprudential practice. This is clearest in case law, and because it is essentially case law all the way down, especially common law. For there, the principal form of justification a judge can offer for her application of a legal concept strict liability, duty of care, and so on, is a suitable rational reconstruction of prior applications, which are considered precedential in that they reveal explicitly some of the contours of the underlying law that's taken to be implicit in the juridical tradition. Hegel reads Kant as already having had the idea that representation is at base a normative concept. Something counts as a representing in virtue of being responsible to something else, which counts as represented by it in virtue of exercising authority over the representing by serving as a standard for assessments of its correctness as a representing. It's in precisely this sense that a recollective story treats the commitments it surveys as representings of the content currently treated as factual. The current commitment, in which the sequence being reconstructed culminates, is treated as authoritative for the previous commitments that sequence comprises, and they're treated as responsible to it, in that it provides the standard for assessing the extent to which they are successful or adequate expressions and so representations of it. In picking out a trajectory from the actual experiences of error that led up to the currently endorsed conceptual content, all of which exhibit that intentionality by standing in relations of incompatibility and consequence, a trajectory that's expressively progressive by that standard, thereby turning a mere past into an intelligible history of discovery, the recollection treats them as responsible to it in the sense required for them to be representations of it, that is to exhibit of intentionality. It's the sort of process that institutes representational relations, the process whereby conceptual contents become representations, as Hegel says, to a consciousness. It's accordingly by engaging in a course of experience, a sequence of episodes of the experience of error, each of which exhibits all three phases, critical registration of an incompatibility of commitments, constructive repair of the incompatibility by alteration of commitments, and recollective vindication of the new constellation of commitments, that knowing subjects establish representational semantic relations between what play the role for Hegel of senses and reference. Hegelian senses are, for him as for Frege, thoughts as thinkables. For Hegel, that means conceptual contents, apt both to be thinkable and, when all goes right, factual, to be the facts thought or as we could also say, thought about. They're thinkable, conceptually contentful, in virtue of standing in relations of material incompatibility and consequence to other such contents. As such, they exhibit that intentionality, for they can be the content of thoughts that things are thus and so. Recollective rational reconstruction of an expressively progressive trajectory culminating in a thinkable endorsed as factual precipitates out a representational relation. That anaphorically structured representational relation exhibits the elements of the favored trajectory as exhibiting also of intentionality by expressing contents that are more or less, ad, more or less adequate explicit expressions and so representations of the content finally endorsed, which accordingly shows up as having been all along implicit in them. This is Hegel's story about what a subject has to do in order to bring about representational semantic relations between its thoughts and the facts. Recollection is accordingly the core of his pragmatist semantics and of his conceptual idealism. Hegel strongly contrasts the way of thinking he wants to recommend the expressive 
paradigm with representational ways of thinking. His recollective elaboration of expression is designed to give semantic representationalism its due by reconstructing in expressive terms what representationalists were right about. Conceptual content does have a representational dimension and it can and ought to be understood ultimately in recollective expressivist terms. To explain Hegel's expressivist rational reconstruction of representational relations, we can use Frege's semantic vocabulary of sense and reference as an amphibious intermediary between representationalist and expressivist semantic idioms. On the one hand, it's recognizably a way of talking about representings and representants. Senses do refer to, and in that sense, represent their reference. On the other hand, the senses that semantically determine reference are also thought of, as Frege did, as intrinsically graspable. For Hegel following Kant, that means they're conceptually contentful. Hegel's understanding of conceptual contentfulness as articulation by relations of material incompatibility and consequence provides a model of thoughts as senses. Hylomorphic conceptual realism then underwrites the idea of the categorical homogeneity of senses as graspable thoughts and their reference, what they represent, as correspondingly conceptually contentful, statable, thinkable facts. And this makes intelligible the idea that thoughts are the explicit expressions of facts. They make explicit for consciousness how the world is in itself, implicitly, an sich. The objective idealist appeal to reciprocal sense dependence between specifications of objective facts and their modal relations on the one hand, and norm governed practices of practically acknowledging the consequences of one commitment, one's commitments by rejecting others and accepting yet others is one step in filling in the expressive story. That story is completed though, by appealing to the model of practical agency to yield an understanding of expression in terms of recollection. The result is an expressive account of the representational dimension of conceptual content in the form of a recollective account of representation. Now, in the third part of my story, I wanna to turn to uh, a higher level account of uh, what's been discovered here, uh, according, to, uh, according to Hegel. Uh, the change from thinking in meta-categories of Verstand, understanding, to thinking in meta-categories of Vernunft, and how we need to rethink the notion of determinateness of conceptual content. At the end of each successful episode of the experience of error, rational harmony has been restored to the subject's commitments. The incompatibility detected has been repaired and the resulting constellation of commitments recollectively vindicated by recollecting it as the result of a course of experience that's been selected and rationally reconstructed as an unbroken, expressively progressive, triumphalist narrative of revelation and discovery as the gradual making explicit of what is presented as having been all along implicit. But Hegel takes it that every achievement of this sort of rational equilibrium is temporary. It's fated to be disrupted by the eruption of new anomalies. Acquiring new empirical commitments immediately in the sense of non-inferentially or perceptually, and immediately by inferentially extracting consequences from one's current commitments, fulfilling one's ampliative rational task responsibility, Will Hegel claims inevitably, sooner or later, result in one's finding oneself once again with commitments that are incompatible with one another by one's own lights, that is by the conceptual contents one takes them to have. The plight of finite knowing and acting subjects metaphysically guarantees liability to empirical error and practical failure. The experience of error is inescapable. What I earlier called the false starts, wrong turns and dead ends of inquiry can be retrospectively edited out of the sanitized, whiggish, vindicating recollective narrative, but they can't be avoided going forward. Why not? In short, because the rational conceptual character of the world 
and its stubborn recalcitrance to mastery by knowledge and agency are equally fundamental primordial features of the way things are. On the one hand, the world is lawful, articulated by alethic modal relations of incompatibility and necessary consequence, so conceptually contentful and graspable. As Hegel says elsewhere, to him who looks on the world rationally, the world looks rationally back. Reality is, in Hegel's terms, thoroughly mediated. On the other hand, it's shot through with brute immediacy, which impinges on thought through perception. Kant, following the empiricist tradition, conceives the task of conceptualizing sensuous immediacy as an uncompletable infinite task. For him, sensuous immediacy is conceptually inexhaustible. There's no aspect of what you see when you look at the palm of your hand that you cannot express in a perceptual judgment. But no matter how many such judgments you make, you'll never run out of new as yet unexpressed judgments that would codify genuine features of what you see. One of Hegel's most original ideas is his understanding of the sense in which the immediacy of objective being outruns what can be captured conceptually in subjective thought. His understanding of it not in terms of the necessary inexhaustibility of actuality by empirical judgments, but in terms rather of the necessary instability of determinate empirical contents. For Hegel, the experience of error requires not just the revision of beliefs, doxastic commitments, but also of meanings, the concepts or conceptions that articulate empirical judgments. If my concept of acid includes as circumstances of appropriate application, tasting sour, and as appropriate consequences of application, turning litmus paper red, then if I run across something that tastes sour and turns litmus paper blue, I will find myself with commitments that are incompatible by my own lights. The world, it seems, will not let me have that concept of acid because it commits me to consequences that do not in fact follow in the objective world. In response to registered anomalies, I might need to revise not just my doxastic commitments, but also my broadly inferential commitments concerning what's incompatible with what and what follows from what. In fact, Hegel, in striking contrast to Kant, thinks that there is and could in principle be no set of determinate empirical concepts that even when correctly applied to things, according to the circumstances and consequences of application defining those concepts, there can't be any set of concepts whose application will not eventually lead to the undertaking of incompatible commitments articulated by those concepts and hence to the experience of error. This is his way of registering immediacy as an irreducible, ineliminable aspect of objective being and hence of thought about it. The manifestation of stubborn residual immediacy in thought is the inevitability of the experience of error. Every recollectively vindicated, rationally harmonious constellation of commitments recollectively achieved along the way is fragile, precarious, and in principle temporary doomed eventually to be riven by incompatibility and unmasked as presenting one more appearance of a reality that is thereby shown to be elusive. Hegel presents the tension between the ineluctability of error and the realistic possibility of genuine knowledge as not only destructive, but also productive. Both express valid perspectives on what is always at once both the experience of error and the way of truth. The important thing, he thinks, is not to seize exclusively, he says one-sidedly, on either aspect, but to understand the nature of the process as one that necessarily shows up from both perspectives. It's of the essence of the historical process of experience to afford both retrospective and prospective temporal perspectives on it. Looking back, from the vantage point of each recollectively vindicated constellation of commitments resulting from the repair of acknowledged incompatibility, one sees unbroken epistemic expressive progress culminating in the achievement of genuine knowledge of truths as construed by bimodal hylomorphic conceptual realism. But looking forward, one sees the inevitable decay of each such beautiful harmony 
by the unavoidable advent of commitments incompatible with one another by their own lights and the initiation of new trifold episodes of the experience of error. The retrospective point of view, the owl of Minerva flying only at dusk, recollectively producing by rational reconstruction an expressively progressive tradition in which what was implicit becomes explicit for consciousness makes visible the sense in which subjective thought can genuinely grasp the objective world, how things can be for consciousness what they are in themselves. The prospective point of view focuses on the ruptures occasioned by the disparities between successive recollective reconstructions as what is endorsed by one is rejected by a later one. It makes visible the sense in which the immediacy of any determinate conceptual mediated structure inferentially articulated by relations of material incompatibility and consequence is outrun. One of Hegel's animating ideas is that the independence of immediacy, its distinctive authority over structures of mediation is manifested in its role as a principle of instability as providing a normative demand for change, for both rejection and further development of each constellation of determinate concepts and commitments articulated by them, what Hegel calls the concept. The independence of mediation, its distinctive authority over immediacy, by contrast, is manifested in all the retrospective recollective vindications of prior constellations of commitments as genuine knowledge as resulting from the expressively progressive revelation of reality by prior claims to knowledge. Determinate negation, material incompatibility, is not only the fundamental conceptual structure, but also marks the moment of immediacy within which what is conceptually articulated, whether on the side of, within what is conceptually articulated, whether on the side of being or of thought. Immediacy in the realm of of being necessarily produces or reveals via perception of cognitive error and practical failure, the incompatibilities of commitment that normatively oblige the knowing and acting subject to do something, to engage in the reparative and recollective phases of experience. The forward-looking obligation to repair acknowledged incompatibilities of commitment acknowledges error and the inadequacy of its conceptions. The backward-looking recollective obligation to rationalize as expressively progressive, previous now superseded repairs and recollections institutes knowledge, truth, and determinate concepts whose incompatibilities and consequences track those articulating in a different modal key, the objective world. Acknowledging this obligation by, re by constructing retrospective, expressively progressive recollective narratives is the form of what Hegel calls reasons march through history. It's what looking on the world rationally consists in. And that recollective process is also what Hegel calls giving contingency the form of necessity. Objective immediacy, what brutally is, shows up cognitively, becomes something for consciousness, is expressed as sensuous immediacy in the deliverance of commitments by perception. The form of necessity here is normative form necessary, notwendig, for Kant meant in accordance with a rule. That's why for Kant, necessity had two species, natural necessity, articulated by alethic modal relations, and practical necessity, articulated by deontic normative relations. The intrusions of commitments arrived at non-inferentially in perception give rise to anomalies through engendering incompatibilities. Giving those eruptions the form of necessity is incorporating them into an expressively progressive recollective narrative that exhibits them as the agents whereby the true contents of concepts are gradually revealed and made more explicit. Understanding the experiential process, which comprises both what shows up when that process is viewed retrospectively and what shows up when it's viewed prospectively, so as to see truth and error as equally essential complementary aspects of it, as two sides of one coin, requires, Hegel thinks, radically reconceptualizing both truth and determinateness. The key in each case is to understand them not as properties, states, or relations that can be instantiated at a single time, 
but as structural features of enduring experiential processes. This is making the shift from the static modern metaconceptual structure that Hegel calls Verstand to the dynamic successor metaconceptual structure he calls Vernunft. According to the categories of Verstand, understanding as articulated by Kant, for instance, the understanding has available to it a stock of concepts that are determinate in that it's already settled in advance what manifolds of intuition they can successfully synthesize. What's recognizably a cognate Verstand conception of determinateness shows up in Frege as the requirement that concepts fix extensions in the sense of determining for every possible object whether that object does or does not fall under the concept. The view is that fixed permanent truths can be formulated using concepts that are determinate, determinate in this sense, and that progress in knowledge consists in endorsing more and more such truths and rejecting more and more falsehoods formulated in terms of those same determinate concepts. By contrast, the metaconceptual standpoint of Vernunft focuses on the malleability of concepts. In the toy example of an experience of error I mentioned a minute ago, a subject finds herself with commitments incompatible by her own lights because she endorses a concept of acid that includes tasting sour as a sufficient reason for applying the concept and turning litmus paper red as a necessary consequence of its application. Immediate perceptual experience of a liquid that tastes sour and turns litmus paper blue precipitates a crisis. While either of the perceptual judgments, sourness, blue, might be relinquished, progress can consist in amending the content attributed to the concept. Perhaps only substances that both taste sour and combine with metals to form salts should count as acids. Insofar as this emendation is successful, progress is made in that the subject deploys concepts that better track what really follows from what in the objective world. The experience of error obliges not only change of belief, but change of meaning a lesson that Quine would rediscover later on. The metaconceptual the meta move that takes us from Vorstellen to Begreifen, Verstand to Vernunft, is the replacement of the model of experience as representation, an external relation between independently specifiable realms of representings and representants, confronting each other across a gulf, replacing that by a model of experience as expression. This is an internal process of development whereby each single content, retrospectively, recollectively identifiable as persisting throughout the process of its development, shows up originally in implicit form and is expressed or unfolds, becoming available in more and more explicit form. Experience is the process whereby the determinate and so mediated concepts implicit in immediacy come to appear as explicitly mediated. Representational relations then take their explanatorily subsidiary place as arising from one aspect of the activity of developing conceptual contents. The residue of traditional Verstand ways of thinking about cognitive progress that consists in understanding experience as progressive insofar as it asymptotically approaches objective facts and relations of incompatibility and consequence is, according to the more capacious Vernunft picture, one-sided and incomplete. It results from appreciating only the retrospective recollective perspective on experience, which underwrites talks of facts, true claims, and what really follows from or excludes what, objective consequences and incompatibilities, from within each vindicating recollective rational reconstruction. Experience is indeed the royal road of truth and knowledge, but it's not that alone. Taking into account also the prospective perspective on experience, which focuses on the fragility and necessarily temporal, temporary character of any and every set of doxastic and inferential commitments, requires thinking of truth and determinateness as features of the process of experience, rather than as goals that it asymptotically approaches. Experience is the truth process, and it's the process of determining conceptual contents. It's expressively progressive in the sense that the retrospective recollective perspective shows it to be genuinely revelatory of reality. That, ex that experiential process both institutes on the subjective side and discovers on the objective side 
conceptually articulated contents and so truths that are determinate in the Kant Frege of Verstand sense in its recollective phase and that engenders their dissolution in the prospective discovery of residual error. The comprehensive view that encompasses both what shows up as progressive from the retrospective recollective perspective and what shows up as disruptive and erroneous from the prospective perspective, corresponding to different phases of the process of experience, is summarized in a central passage from the preface to the phenomenology. He says, quote, this whole movement constitu constitutes what's positive in it and its truth. This truth therefore includes the negative also, what would be called the false if it could be regarded as something from which one might abstract. The evanescent itself must on the contrary be regarded as essential, not as something fixed and cut off from the true and left lying who knows where outside it, any more than the true is to be regarded as something on the other side, positive and dead. Appearance is the arising and passing away that does not itself arise and pass away, but is in itself and constitutes the actuality and the movement of the life of truth." End of the quote. Appearance here is the phenomena, the world as it shows up for consciousness in the form of conceptual contents articulated by relations of material incompatibility and consequence, which are endorsed by the knowing acting subject of the cycle of cognition and action that is the process of experience. Although each such phenomenon is unmasked as erroneous, as an appearance that in some way misrepresents reality, the recollective phase of experience also reveals each such constellation of commitments to be an appearance of a noumenal reality, what things are in themselves, represented by it, visible as having been all along implicit in it, gradually but inexorably emerging into greater explicitness. The passage continues with one of the most justly famous images of Hegel's whole book. He says, quote, the true is a vast bacchanalian revel with not a soul sober. Yet because each member collapses as soon as he drops out, the revel is just as much transparent and simple repose. Judged in the court of the movement, the single shapes of spirit do not persist any more than determinate thoughts do but they are as much positive and necessary moments as they are negative and evanescent. In the whole of the movement seen as a state of repose, what distinguishes itself therein and gives itself particular existence is preserved as something that recollects itself." End of the quote. In interpreting this allegory, it's important to keep in mind the two levels of concepts that I've been claiming are being considered. The surface topic is the shapes of spirit the various forms exhibited by the normativity, articulating the thinkings and doings of self-conscious subjects, traditional, modern, and beyond. But this is one of the places where Hegel explicitly marks that besides thoughts and concepts at this categorical metal level, the one that takes us from Verstand to Vernunft, he's also addressing the nature and evolution of ground level determinate thoughts and concepts. A characteristic feature of the pragmatist semantic reading I've been presenting here is semantic descent, focusing on what we're supposed to learn about the use and content of these ordinary empirical and practical determinate concepts and commitments. Here in his image, the party goers participating in the movable feast are those commitments, doxastic, practical, and inferential in the broad sense that articulates conceptual content and so includes commitments concerning what is material incompatible with what. The revel is the process of experience. What matters about the image of their drunkenness is its picturing of the restless, woozy jostling and elbowing of each other as different contents of potential commitments that are incompatible with each other in the company of the others already on board seek to make a place at the table by pushing others out. Those that are forced out are immediately replaced by others, so the party continues, though with a shifting cast. The crucial contribution to the festivities that was made by the departed members, those who at some earlier point slipped in sensible beneath the table, is still preserved and recollected in the story the later revelers tell about how they got where they are. This recollective activity establishes the relation between a sequence of phenomena, appearances, senses, representings, and noumena, reality, reference, representeds, in which the latter show up twice, 
both as the current, con current constellation of explicitly endorsed conceptual contents in which the rationally reconstructed sequence culminates, and also as having been all along implicit in and normatively governing that sequence by serving as the standard for assessing the expressive success of its members. It's because the account grounds the semantic relations between senses and reference, representings and representeds, in this recollective activity of the experiencing subjects, I've said, that it deserves to be thought of as offering a pragmatist semantics. But conceptual idealism, the Begreifen that com comprehends Vorstellung, claims that semantic representational relation is both only to be understood expressively in terms of recollective activity and that it's actually produced or instituted by that activity. The distinctive kind of doing that is experienced for Hegel is in its reparative and recollective phases, shaping and determining the conceptual contents the subject endorses at the end of each tripartite episode. In that sense, it's making and producing conceptions and conceptual contents. For instance, for instance, of acids as what both taste sour and combine with metals to produce salts. This is one sense of determining conceptual contents, determining as making up. But the recollective process essentially includes a commitment to having found what it in this sense makes. It's a process of discovery of what has, according to the recollection, all along been expressed and represented, first less and then more adequately, by the sequence of always partly erroneous constellations of commitments in the expressively progressive trajectory, retrospectively, recollectively, rationally reconstructed. That's another sense of determining conceptual contents, determining not as a making, but as a finding out. That it is a finding rather than a making is an essential constitutive commitment, even of, for instance, the jurisprudential species of recollection, which develops and determines legal concepts that are not empirical concepts, in that they're not controlled by perceptually immediate applications of other legal concepts. But repair of an anomaly and its recollective vindication produce new conceptions articulated by deontic normative relations of material incompatibility and consequence. But the result of those activities as such purports to find alethic modal forms of those relations in the objective world being represented. In this hylomorphic sense, the conceptual contents consciousness finds in the world are just those that it has recollectively made. Conceptual idealism asserts that when as self-conscious in the sense of being conscious of itself as conscious, consciousness distinguishes between its certainty and its truth between what things are for it and what they are in themselves, between appearance and reality, representings and representeds, it is neither alienating itself from itself nor acknowledging a confrontation with something alien to it. It's finding out how things really are is a distinctive sui generis kind of active, recollective, non-causal making of that distinction, which is as essential to consciousness as such through its experience. The world as it is in itself, as distinct from how it is for consciousness, is not for Hegel a brute other, but in that distinctive sense, the product of its own recollective activity and experience. That's the story of his idealism. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Brandon, for that excellent talk. Um, we'll take our customary five minute break now and return at 4.55 Pacific time for Q&A. Okay, great, welcome back everyone. So as is our custom, we'll start off the Q&A with 10 minutes for graduate student questions, after which the queue will be opened up to everybody. Um, please use the raise hand feature for a new point or to add yourself to the queue and the raise thumb feature for a follow-up point. And I'll try and keep track of everybody. Uh, so to start us off will be Zach Hall. Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for, for a very wonderful and stimulating talk. Um, I have two um, kind of connected questions. And the first one's about this idea of um, uh, the instability of determinate empirical concepts, this, uh, this um, example of acid that you bring up and 
I guess the way I would be inclined to think about how we ought to inquire scientifically um, would actually not to be to have the kind of concept that your the agent you bring up has where a necessary or, or a, a sufficient um, criterion for application is tasting sour. I, I would actually be, I would think, well, here's an alternative way of thinking about this is uh, have a provisional concept of acid or, or is um, um, something that tastes sour and turns litmus paper red. And then the task of further scientific investigation would be finding out what it takes for something to be acid. So this, what you're describing as the experience of error would be the experience of um, showing what doesn't count as acid. And then all and only cases where you actually find something that is sour and turns litmus paper red tells you more about what acid can be like. So um, that's the first question I have is, do you see any philosophical problems with that alternative way of thinking about open-ended concept formation in natural science. And the other is I'm trying to get a little bit clearer on the relation that you see uh, Kant standing into Hegel on this. So I've done some work on the third critique where I could imagine that, well, with that kind of way of thinking, Kant's appealed to the reflective power of judgment as always needing to form finer and finer grained empirical concepts in response to novel cases might be one way of seeing how with a, with a kind of case such as the one you're raising, the acid one, while you might think not that something is infinitely conceptualizable in sensuous immediacy, as you put it, but maybe in counterfactuals or more intellectual predicates um, that allow us to, to, to more determinately fill in what was as of yet and perhaps open-endedly, infinitely so, uh, a merely provisional concept. Um, and if you have that kind of reading of Kant, it's less clear what's new in the Hegel. So or maybe you disagree with that kind of understanding what's happened in the third critique, but um, so those kind of two questions, the uh, idea about, well, what about provisional concepts that just get more determinately filled in? And then uh, how might that bear on complicating or filling in some detail on how, how Kant relates to Hegel. Okay, good. Uh, look, Hegel all along claims, hey, I'm just a good Kantian. Uh, I, I'm just telling you what the a better wisdom in Kant is. And he certainly is uh, motivated as uh, many of uh, Kant's successors and admirers were by the, by the third critique. Uh, this is sort of a, a bit of conventional wisdom that the way to get to later German idealism from Kant is uh, from the third critique. And Kant is clearly influenced by the account of reflective uh, judgment there. And you know, if you asked him about this, he would say, yes, I am just uh, in my notion of recollection, I'm just making explicit what, what he was getting at here, what, what was implicit in, uh, in this, uh, but radicalizing it in claiming, look, this is not just one thing that goes on in conceptualizing. This is the process of uh, making our concepts determinate or discovering them as uh, determinate. So I think he'd be happy to uh, accept the filiation and the uh, inspiration. Uh, I think it's clear he you know, takes the idea a lot farther than, uh, uh, than Kant did, as I say. Uh, he thinks this uh, recollective rationality is really the major form of rationality. He said it's the form of reasons march through history. It's uh, the way we see reason in nature. This is what we have to do recollectively in order to live in a rational world. And that that's way beyond the, uh, that. That is not something Kant, even at the stage of the third critique, would have he would have given an the reflective exercise of reason, that sort of, that sort of significance. Yeah, on, on the other account, uh, Hegel doesn't uh, interpret his, uh, 
meta concepts by applying them to ordinary determinate concepts very often. Uh, when Kant made this, uh, I want to say discovery that besides ordinary empirical and practical concepts, there are framework explicitating concepts. Um, that was then pretty much all he cared about. Uh, it was this new uh, things. This was going to be the structure of the mind that he was that he was discovering, and Hegel too. Uh, that that is uh, what he principally explicitly wrote about. It's my claim that uh, because and insofar as these are meta concepts, they are making explicit features of the framework within which we apply. Uh, and, and use the determinate level concepts, that the best way for us to understand what Kant and Hegel are saying about them is to think of what they're telling us about uh, the use of ordinary empirical concepts, the sense in which they're contentful, uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, they, they didn't do the, the semantic descent to uh, do that application, uh, that's, that I think they left as an exercise to us. And that's uh, my strategy for uh, explaining what they're doing without giving the big recollection that is the phenomenology of the whole of human experience or the science of logic. Uh, I'm saying there's this shortcut through uh, thinking about the determinate concepts. So I don't know how happy he would be with the picture I was, you know, implicitly invoking there of the uh, conceptual content as articulated, at least in part by circumstances of appropriate application and consequences of appropriate application of the concept with the thought that uh, in applying the concept, one is implicitly committing oneself to the goodness of the inferential connection between the circumstances and the consequences. And that that was the sort of thing that uh, in uh, connection with uh, a whole body of other concepts can lead one to have the world say, nope, uh, you, can't have, you can't have that one. I mean, in the form you were talking about it, the world would be saying, well, there aren't any assets. You know, good concept, but it turns out there aren't any because uh, it just doesn't follow from being sour that uh, it, it'll turn this paper red. Uh, but but I think this is a reasonable way to to think about uh, the kind of evolution of um, our commitment to the incompatibilities and consequences uh, of them. But thank you. Thanks. Um, so next will be Mika, after which I'll note that the floor is open for questions from all comers. So Mika. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, fascinating talk. I've never really thought about the phenomenology in, in these terms and it's, it's uh, super insightful. Um, so my question is that under your reading, it seems like, um, it seems like because error is inescapable, the dialectic will never come to like a rest, like a final rest. And I wonder, um, under that kind of reading, what does the absolute mean for Hegel? Um, so what's, what's that concept to him if, uh, if it's not this idea that the dialectic will ever reach like a rest where, okay, here, we reached it. Okay, well, uh, I mean, I should confess that my my reading of Hegel is a critical reading. That is, though, you know, I wouldn't be explicating him if I weren't learning a lot from it and didn't think he gave us a language that was helpful in thinking about this. You know, I, I don't think he got it all right. Uh, and the core of uh, what's critical about my reading has to do with the treatment of these two kinds of concepts, the sort of ground level determinate concepts and the meta uh, concepts. He thought they were alike in one way and not alike in another way. And the way he thought they were uh, not alike is that he thought determinate concepts, 
uh, will be developing and changing forever. Uh, there, is no, there is no end point to that. Whereas the meta concepts, we can get an expressively completely adequate set of meta concepts, one that will give us uh, absolute, absolutely complete self-consciousness will let us articulate, this set of concepts will let us articulate what we're doing in knowing and acting in our cognitive and practical uh, activity. And he thought he had basically gotten those. And those are the ones that uh, get recollectively vindicated one way in the phenomenology and another way in uh, the science of logic. So, you know, people misunderstand and think he thought that the, you know, his talk about achieving absolute knowing, this is a frightening concept at the end of the phenomenology, uh, meant he was envisaging an end of empirical science or inquiry or something. And he's absolutely clear that that's, that that's not true. Uh, I think that uh, he's wrong in thinking that because they are these meta concepts that we can be done with them once and for all too. Uh, that in fact, there are different senses of consequence and incompatibility and uh, the uh, meta language in which we articulate conceptual contents, the pragmatic and semantic meta language, that's gonna develop in just, you know, in an open-ended way, just the same as the other. So uh, I, I don't accept, I don't take him to be right in thinking we can come to uh, fully know the absolute, to have absolute knowing. Uh, the other way, by the way, that he, uh, the other relation that he thinks there is between the, these concepts, I said, well, there's one way in which he thinks they're, that the meta concepts are different from the uh, ground level concepts. We can get a final completely adequate set of meta concepts, but not for the ground level concepts. Uh, he also thought they were alike in one way, which is that, uh, in one important way, which is that in principle, the only way to grasp the conceptual content of either kind of concept is recollectively by rationally reconstructing uh, a history of the development uh, of it. Uh, and I think that's true of empirical ground level concepts, but I don't think it's true of the meta concepts. I think the fact that they have this distinctive expressive role, that their job is to make explicit uh, what we're doing in uh, making judgments, in forming intentions and so on, gives us another way of conveying their content, namely by using them to talk about uh, determinate uh, the use of determinate concepts, that is by semantic descent. So I also think there's sort of a shortcut for the meta concepts that uh, doesn't exist for the others. So those are the two basic axes of my, uh, of the critical side of my reading is he thought these two kinds of concepts were alike in one way. I say, uh, no, they're not. And he thinks they're different in one way. And I say, no, they're not. Thank you. Pat. Uh, so I would like to ask you about this concept of semantic dissent uh, by way of some questions also about your interpretation of Hegel. Uh, and so I agree with you 100% about this idea that in your, in your critical reading that the logical categories themselves, the meta-conceptual level is itself, it transforms, uh, you know, in some sense. Uh, I, I'm not certain so much uh, that Hegel disagreed with that, because what I think is that the uh, self-consciousness of the absolute idea is precisely a self-consciousness of a kind of conceptual motion that is true at both the meta level and the empirical level. Now, I think maybe, maybe you don't even need to take that on board to see uh, a consequence of that, which is that if we have this Vernunft style uh, meta-conceptual understanding of what we're doing, we are building these uh, uh, original expressions of uh, reality of the noumena that then become appearances and a recollective story that is taken up at a further stage when these incompatibilities are generated, et cetera, et cetera. 
that, that should affect the methodology of the empirical practice of, you know, finding out uh, facts about the world in the first place. And so for me, that would be like absolute knowing, right? Absolute knowing would be an understanding of how to understand the world and understanding itself in this uh, motive fashion, right? So my question for you is, uh, regardless of whether you agree that you can, act, you can also do that with the logic, what do you see as the sort of practical consequences of uh, really understanding this theory for what it means to give a now version of our interpretation of the world? Uh, is this something that you see as uh, being instantiated in certain specific kinds of recognitive relationships among knowers, among scientific practitioners? Uh, do those take a different form uh, after we've gotten this realization than before it? Yeah, I think that's that's my general question. Thank you. Okay, uh, good. Uh, I mean, I would be happy if we didn't have to pin on Hegel commitment to having achieved the final uh, the final set of meta categories. Uh, but I think he's pretty explicit in various places in the encyclopedia that he thinks uh, that's where we are. But the idea of uh, absolute knowing as uh, a form of self-consciousness that is radically different from previous forms of self-consciousness that has crossed a substantial boundary in that now we're self-consciously aware of what we're doing in judging and intending things, uh, that, that we have uh, maybe not the final set of tools for making that explicit, but uh, a set of tools that make that explicit uh, uh, in a way that's qualitatively different from what we ever had uh, before. So a decisive boundary has been uh, crossed as decisive as the boundary from traditional ways of thinking to the, to the modern ones. Uh, that that uh, I'm on board with, I think he did do that. Now you ask about the practical consequences of, okay, achieving that uh, uh, degree and kind of uh, self-consciousness. And here, I mean, this is not, uh, this is a, a, uh, a theme in uh, a spirit of trust that I didn't gesture at or even hint at uh, here, but it's an important one. Uh, I read Hegel as having uh, what one would think was an eximeron, uh, a semantics with an edifying effect, uh, a semantics that when one properly understands it, normatively demands that you be a different kind of person than you were before you became semantically self-conscious. So I see a practical, indeed a political uh, consequence to this uh, new form of self-consciousness that he's achieved. Uh, and that has to do not so much with the uh, semantics that I was talking about here, but with the normative pragmatics. That is, uh, when in the self-consciousness uh, chapter for the first time in the phenomenology, uh, we, we, have, we have come in the, the first movement of the book, consciousness and thinking about cognition, uh, to realize that uh, the side of thought, uh, our side, the subjective side of the intentional nexus is a thoroughly normative uh, one. It's a matter of commitments. Uh, uh, that Kant, in having that insight that uh, what distinguishes rational minded creatures from uh, ones that are not, uh, is that uh, we're responsible for our judgments and our doings in a sense in which rational ones aren't. They express commitments uh, of ours that the question of whether we're rationally entitled to them. And these are all normative uh, notions that uh, Kant had seen us as normative creatures uh, in the first instance and seen intentionality as a normative achievement uh, that to become semantically self-conscious, we have to understand normativity. And Hegel understands normativity following out um, 
uh, a common uh, theme of the Enlightenment that uh, Kant had been responded to, had responded to as well, that rather than thinking of normative statuses uh, in traditional terms of being a superior or a subordinate or being authoritative or responsible as features of the non-human world, uh, as objective features of the world as uh, had traditionally been done, that we thought of them as uh, globally instituted by our attitudes, that uh, there were no statuses of authority and responsibility, superiority and subordination uh, until we started taking or treating each other as authoritative, responsible, superior, subordinate, obliged, uh, permitted, uh, and so on. Kant's autonomy uh, view of normativity is one way of thinking about how uh, attitudes of acknowledging a commitment uh, can institute commitments. Uh, I think Hegel thought that Kant saw a basic normative status being having the authority to make oneself responsible having the authority to commit oneself in judgment and uh, in action. But Hegel is unhappy with, um, and so the idea that we make ourselves responsible by exercising that authority, but uh, Hegel sees Kant as insufficiently articulate, insufficiently inquiring about the nature of that authority. Uh, for Kant, we just, come as having that authority that is to be rational. There is a sort of social dimension in Kant. We're obliged to recognize the dignity of other creatures, that is, of other rational beings, that is to acknowledge their authority to commit themselves. Uh, but that's just a fact that they have that authority, which we're obliged to acknowledge. Hegel thinks, well, that authority is itself instituted by attitudes of acknowledging it, of recognizing it. Uh, that's why fundamentally uh, normative statuses are social statuses. They're instituted by reciprocal recognition. And when we get this uh, advanced form of self-consciousness about normativity, we see that in uh, thinking, in uh, committing ourselves in acknowledging the obligation to repair incompatibilities in our doxastic or practical commitments, we're implicitly acknowledging uh, commitment to, an implicit commitment to uh, a, a community of reciprocal recognizers, which is incompatible with uh, the kind of power asymmetric power relations where uh, the, that Hegel's image for is the master and the slave, where the idea is that all the authority is with the master, the superior, and all the responsibility is with the slave. And yet the fact is that the master is only the master in virtue of being recognized by the slave. Uh, and that's a kind of authority that the slave has that the master can't get over. That's an unstable, uh, essentially, uh, a situation that essentially precludes self-consciousness. So, you know, there's a long story there. I, I think this is one of the exciting things about uh, uh, Hegel's story. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the difference is that we will see that uh, we're implicitly, by being uh, having so much as having determinate thoughts that we're implicitly acknowledging uh, a commitment to uh, our recognitive community having a certain structure to recognition taking the form that he uh, describes as uh, confession and forgiveness uh, and that I picking up one of his terms call recognition in the form of trust. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. So I just want to note that we have about 10 minutes or so left until our official stopping point and still a number of people left in the queue. So I encourage everyone to ask the pithiest version of their questions. And with that, 
Thomas, please. So unfair to lead into my question like that, Dan. Uh, <laughs> so I, I wanted to thank you for a really rich uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to try and quickly articulate a microscopic confusion and then a macroscopic worry that the confusion leads into. So the microscopic confusion is, I was confused by the way the alethic and the deontic, and in particular, the understanding of those domains under the aspect of the nomological and the normative were being, it seemed in the first part of the talk, contrasted or set against each other. So it's unclear to me why I should think of the nomological as anything other than a specific subspecies of the higher genus of the normative. Uh, it seems to me that law just is a specific flavor of normativity, maybe a norm that brooks no exception or something of the sort. And if that's in any way right, then the macroscopic worry is that that sort of essential dependence uh, of the nomological on the normative seems built into any sort of hylomorphic conception of the relationship between matter and form. So a key part of Aristotle's hylomorphism and Plato's proto-hylomorphism is going to be the dependence of the matter on the form and potential potentiality on actuality. Matter is matter for form insofar as it's matter for a certain kind of form in particular, just like potentiality is the potentiality for a certain kind of actuality. And so hylomorphism seems to have baked into it an asymmetric relationship between matter and form. And so I'm wondering if when you say that uh, Hegel's understanding is hylomorphic, we should expect it to manifest the same sort of asymmetry. Does the alethic modality of the objective qua matter of thought have an asymmetric dependence on the deontic modality of the subjective qua formal? Uh, I thought that might be where you were going, but then you started talking about the stubborn recalcitrance of the objective. And so it didn't seem, it seemed to have a more robust and independent existence than that sort of asymmetric dependence would suggest. Yeah, okay. This is, that's a very good and penetrating uh, question. Uh, the term hylomorphic may be uh, misleading there because I don't think uh, it's uh, that that his model, as I understand it, is very much like uh, the Aristotelian model. I, I meant by it just that there's a notion of content, I would say, rather than matter, uh, that can take these two forms. Uh, and it, it's important that they're forms of one thing. Uh, now, there is a sense in which um, we need to understand the alethic uh, relations in terms of normative ones. And you know, the mere fact that uh, Newton found it natural to use the term law uh, for the relations he was, uh, he was seeing is sort of indicating this. Uh, and the, the but, but I do want to, want to see um, a lethic modality as standing on its own, separate from uh, deontic norms, from talk of for me, commitment and entitlement or authority and uh, responsibility. Um, they are reciprocally sense dependent. So uh, you can't understand what you're saying when you talk about there being a law of nature. Uh, uh, without understanding what it is to explain one thing in terms of another. Uh, inferentially, you can't understand what a fact is without understanding what it is to make a judgment, to, to say that things uh, are thus. And so you can't understand what uh, terms that refer and predicates that classify are, uh, except in terms of what you're doing Sorry, you can't understand objects and properties except in terms of what you're doing in referring with terms and uh, uh, predicating with predicates. And I want to say vice versa. As the, these, uh, I think it's a reciprocal, uh, a reciprocal sense dependence. But what I have to do to take uh, uh, conducting electricity to be a necessary property of copper, uh, what I have to do is uh, acknowledge a commitment to its conducting electricity whenever I commit myself to the coin being copper uh, and hold other people responsible uh, for that uh, as well. Uh, so uh, I, I wanna keep, keep these on a par. Now, so the conceptual realism does, what I called objective idealism that I just went by really fast was this reciprocal uh, 
sense dependence relation, which crucially is not a reference dependence relation. It's not that there wouldn't be laws of nature if we didn't reason. It's just we can't understand what we're saying when we say that there are without um, expanding the picture to include what we're doing in uh, reasoning. But what I called conceptual idealism is claiming that there's an asymmetric dependence and a priority of the normative. Uh, and that's what I was trying to get at at the end with this uh, making that is a finding, this non-causal uh, sense in which uh, the representational relation between uh, the objective world and our subjective thoughts of it is something we do uh, and that the, the accordingly the very idea of an objective world is in this sense the product of our uh, activity that uh, that distinction is so so I, I think of his absolute idealism as consisting of the nested claims uh, nested in that they get less and less plausible uh, the conceptual realism to begin with the objective idealism and then this uh, uh, conceptual uh, idealism. Great. So I think probably with our final question then will be Robert Engelman. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. It was really uh, exciting and enriching. Um, so I guess one way to maybe introduce where I'm heading with my question is uh, I'm wondering if you read the phenomenology as being in effect inconsistent with Hegel's logic and maybe even with the mature system. Uh, so the reason I, I bring that up is because although you point out how in the phenomenology Hegel moves from a representational conception of experience to an expressivist one and that that's what he maintains, um, throughout the paper you talk about appearance as subjective in Hegel, whereas, you know, in the logic, it's part of the objective logic uh, appearance. And even when he moves through varieties of appearance from Schein or Scheinung, Oizerung, Offenbarung, um, we're ultimately led to an even more sort of emphatically objective uh, conception of appearance. Um, so um, yeah, my, my question then is whether you think there's an inconsistency on this point, whether Hegel meant that, if this was a sort of revision of the thoughts we get in the phenomenology, thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, my thought has evolved on this. In, in the early years of working on the project, I did think uh, that um, there was an inconsistency between them and one just had to pick uh, between these views. And I could not see how the author of the phenomenology could have come round to these other, uh, to these other views. Uh, but I came to think that wasn't, and it was the, just the sort of thing that you were uh, pointing to uh, that made me think that. Uh, but, but I don't think that anymore. I, I think now that one can understand uh, at any rate where the science of logic ends. So the doctrine of the idea, basically the whole, the uh, that that's another uh, presentation of the same picture that Hegel ends up with at the end of the phenomenology. Uh, and in the original plan for uh, a spirit of trust, the plan was to write a meaty chapter that would justify that claim, uh, but that did not happen. And I would not have finished the book if I had waited uh, to, to do that. Uh, but, but I still do believe it and you know, may eventually get that said, specifically about the point about uh, uh, Zion and Shine, that distinction being in uh, the objective logic. Well, yes, but I don't think that's incompatible with the view I was attributing to him because that's where, that, that's uh, the notion of uh, appearance as articulating what it is to be objectively real. That contrast between uh, what in the phenomenology is appearance is what things are for consciousness and uh, what things are in them selves, uh, that's where, you know, that's a deepening of our understanding of objectivity to see that that very idea involves the contrast uh, and 
you know, emphasized in the phenomenology that it involves the transition, uh, the change of status of a commitment from it being a commitment to how things objectively are to are realizing, no, that can't be quite right. That was just my view. That was just an, an appearance. Uh, so, you know, he uses different language in uh, the logic. And I think uh, there's an interesting job of work to be done, uh, sort of moving back and forth uh, between them. But I don't think in the end, uh, the story about uh, appearance is in, is in, in the logic is inconsistent with uh, the story I was attributing to him in the phenomenology. Great, thank you so much. And I think with that, we've just about hit our time. So I'd ask everyone to please join me in again, thanking Professor Brandon for this excellent talk, for joining us today. And we're very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Well, it was good. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>